Uh, in March this year, speaking to the Daily Telegraph, General Ray Odiano uh, said this. Now, these remarks caused a stir. Most of the media and political debate that swirled around his intervention was, of course, focused on defense spending and the 2% pledge. That was in part, perhaps in part, his intent. But having served with General Odierno uh, and HR, when he commanded 4ID in Tikrit in 2003, I've got too much respect for him not to believe that he chose his words and the yardstick of a di division carefully and precisely. General Odierno is not the only voice urging the maintenance of the divisional level of capabilities. Of those countries that retain a meaningful defense capability, the US have 11 deployable divisions plus eight National Guard, Russia 10, China 34, and Iran 7. Perhaps most tellingly, France, our nearest peer, has concluded from her experience of the last decade, when brigades became the unit of currency, that it's the division that offers greater utility and flexibility, and is now regrowing to establish two balanced, deployable, and ready warfighting divisions. The UK has one deployable division focused, optimized for warfighting, and that's the third UK division. So why does this yardstick of a division matter? What's the relevance and utility today of a formation instituted by Frederick the Great, and in the UK's rather typically late by Wellington in 1809? Well, the answer to this lies in the lessons of history, the present, and what we may expect from the future. And I've chosen five to focus on. Firstly, the division gives the UK a degree of sovereign autonomous capability for the unseen. Slim told us that the division is the smallest formation that is a complete orchestra of war. It's therefore arguably the lowest level at which a country retains a measure of security independence, of self-sufficiency, and the ability to act unilaterally in its national interest. Drop below the divisional level and you surrender the last vestiges of self-reliance and become entirely dependent on allies when engaged in protecting the national interest on land, where all conflict is ultimately resolved. To not have a division would deny politicians what they need and what they expect, sovereign political choice and options. In this respect, the division is one of the cornerstones of UK hard power without which soft power is simply bluff. Secondly, it provides credibility and a key component of our ability to deter. It's unlikely to be an accident that our closest allies and some of our potential adversaries have chosen to reinvest, reinvest at this level. Now, this is in part what General Odierno was getting at. It's both the integrated combat power a division provides and our proven and respected command and control ability at the divisional level that attracts allies to work alongside or under British command. In the case of three UK Div, Italy, France, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Germany, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia all regularly beat a path to our door. And one that the US desire alongside a US division or under command of a US Corps. This credibility makes us a reference army, underpinning our ability to exercise our influence in pursuit of the national interest through defense engagement. Most recently, the Nigerian chief of the army staff may have been less inclined to accept British offers of advice and help in the fight against Boko Haram without our proven capability and reputation at this level. And so our ability to engage in a country in which we have direct national security interests could have been significantly weakened. Thirdly, it offers relevance to the security environment we now find ourselves in. It's the lowest level of formation that can truly integrate partners without, without, uh, with whom almost any future operation would be conducted. Coalition, partners across government, the Foreign Office, DFID, the Home Office and the Intelligence Services, and our sister services. Three UK Div is airland by design, routinely exercises uh, with the Royal Marines uh, in the literal. This, re re this relevance gives us options, allowing HMG to deliver a division into many alliance permutations, including NATO, the CGF of France, or bilaterally with the US. In short, the division is the first level at which one can achieve full combined joint interagency, intragovernmental, and multinational inter integration. It makes the division optimized to operate in the contemporary information environment, able to apply what CGS termed integrated action 
which you heard about yesterday in yesterday's session uh, chaired by Graham Lamb. This unifying doctrine for the Army, nested within joint action, is distilled from what we've learned from a decade of contemporary operations and campaigns. We've also learned that the division is the first level at which the orchestration of kinetic and non-kinetic effects can be applied to achieve sustainable political outcomes through the sophisticated integration of land maneuver, joint fires, information activity, and capacity building. No subordinate level of command has the capability, capacity, experience, or hierarchy of wisdom necessary to achieve this. And lest we overlook it in terms of relevance to the situation on NATO's eastern flank, the potential for hard power projection of a division has unique value in terms of deterrence and reassurance, something that the Lithuanian Land Forces Commander was at pains to stress to CLF and me only yesterday. Fourthly, the division offers utility. The Army's 2020 structure has established three divisional level organizations optimized for complementary purposes and each symbiotically linked. As well as providing the seed corn for a second division or warfighting division, Headquarters 1 UK division is optimized for defense engagement, as you've heard, delivering capacity building and upstream understanding and conflict prevention. In times of crisis, we'd be heavily dependent on the critical relationships the First Division maintains and the sophisticated understanding of a region it provides. It was access to a similar resource that enabled the French to act with such alacrity, sophistication and audacity in Mali and the Central African Republic. And Force Troops Command, my other sister division, which of course commands scarce capabilities, creating and exploiting synergies between them. Without Force Troops Command, I would not be able to integrate critical capabilities such as 77 Brigade, the ISR Brigade, Joint Fires through 1RT Brigade, and the engineering support through 8 Force Engineer Brigade. The third leg of this stool, of course, is 3 UK Div. Its primary purpose, to prepare, deploy, and command the UK's high readiness forces and those of allies for combat. It provides a range of capabilities optimized for operations ranging from warfighting, counterinsurgency, peace support, and support to UK resilience. It's the British high Army's high, re high readiness reaction force, and as such, it forms the main intervention capability of the GEF. The division is highly flexible. This is often misunderstood. It's frequently and rather lazily assumed that a division automatically and always equates to 30,000 men and vast numbers of vehicles. Not so. The division is scalable and modular. It can plan and execute operations at any level or scale of effort. The force package is configured according to the operational need. This could range from a small standalone fly forward headquarters of 100 that we hold a very high readiness, a task force of two to 3,000, a brigade of 5,000, or an in extremist full deployment of the 30,000 men. It's this inherent agility in force packaging that gives the division such utility, and it's a marked difference from the divisional construct of previous era. It can draw on its three organic armored infantry brigades and logistics brigade. It's trained and prepared to take under command 16 air assault brigade, three commander brigade, joint force elements from the Royal Air Force, Jeff partner nation brigades, and US BCTs. It can move, fight, and protect itself in high threat places against capable or near peer mixed forces within all the dimensions of maneuver, physical, cognitive, and virtual. And in the future, it'll hold joint strike brigades and an experimentation force. In the last 12 months, the division has projected battle group level deployments into Eastern Europe, has held the lead armored task force at readiness, and in 2017, it will be the lead for the VJTF. My final one, it's the division, it's division's command and control capability that offers the greatest utility, and that distinguishes it from the brigade level, arguably offering one of the unique selling points of a credible top-tier reference army. This allows you to write the script rather than being reactive. This level of command is all about choreography. The most difficult operations, and there are a few easy ones at present, require an orchestral approach. How can a range of options be brought together harmoniously, in other words, integrated, at the right time, in the right place, with the, right, with the required degree of sophistication, assurance, and a reasonable span of command. 
the divisional level frees up subordinate commanders to concentrate on the tactical fight, a lesson from the last decade where we expected too much, perhaps, from relatively junior brigade commanders, and I speak as one put in that position. The divisional commander provides strategic or operational decision makers with a mature and informed interlocutor, though my first platoon sergeant, Geordie Patterson, would not recognize that description and apply to me. And the divisional headquarters, of course, provides a hierarchy of wisdom. It provides the gearing between tactical actions and the strategic and operational level. In contrast to a dedicated or a standing operational level joint headquarters, the divisional level has the proper expertise and capacity to command and control subordinate land tactical formations. And it's the most effective level at which to integrate air and maritime effects in the land environment. Headquarters 3DIV can provide the nucleus of a theatre headquarters, is the most capable option alongside the ARC for a land component headquarters, and it's the primary choice for a two-star or a one-star led by my next US deputy Joint Task Force headquarters in a land-heavy campaign. It can do all this with an agility, speed, and light footprint that meets Her Majesty's Government's needs. Three UK DIS advanced headquarters, consisting of 100 personnel, held at very high readiness, five days, is capable of deploying with inter integral communications and information systems in two C-17 aircraft and meeting all the tasks I set out previously. It can do this now, using reach back to its main headquarters in Bulford, where the balance and weight of analytical capability exists in a multi-rolled networked command facility. This delivers an advance in theatre presence to link to any theatre headquarters achieving influence, generating tempo and setting the condition for the arrival of further land force elements. So the world has moved on a great deal since Frederick the Great established divisions. The character of conflict has changed. As Clausewitz said, it always does. But one of the constants has remained the enduring relevance and utility of a land formation capable of providing the full orchestra of war under an appropriately experienced and competent land commander albeit today integrating and employing rather different instruments, and of a higher tactical level of command and control that can simultaneously operate at the tactical, theatre, and operational level in the land environment. Integrated, scalable, modular, agile, flexible, muscular, offering political utility and relevance, a cornerstone of UK hard power, and that's just me.